Hey everyone! So this portion is so interesting. Yaakov is heading back to face off with Asaph, and this meeting with the angel is such a strange story. In chapter 32, Yaakov leaves Laban and eventually meets angels in this place called Mahanaim. From there he sends messengers and they come back with this ominous warning. Asaph is coming towards you with, you know, 400 cronies. It's like, gulp, that does not sound good. That sounds threatening. So Yaakov divides the camp, he has these sort of two scenarios in his mind. Like on the one hand, he's sending gifts, hoping, praying that things go peacefully. On the other hand, he's preparing for the worst. If he has to fight, he's dividing up the camp into two groups so that if one gets decimated, God forbid, the other one may be able to escape. And then from verse 10 to verse 13, he's praying, you know, Hashem, please help me. And then in verse 14, it says, Vayal and Sham. He lodged there that night. So he has these two encampments and they go to sleep. You know, good night, kids in camp one, good night, kids in camp two, kisses everybody good night. Then he starts reviewing the gifts that he sent off, you know, and he's going over these gifts that he's sending to Asaph to try to appease him. And then look again how weird it is. In verse 22, it says, so the gifts passed on before him and he lodged that night in the camp, meaning now he goes back to sleep. For the second time, it's saying that he's going to sleep to lodge in the camp. And he set his plan into motion. Should be a good night's sleep, right? Good night, everybody. But then look what happens in verse 23. It says that he arose during that night. He took his two wives and his two maidservants and his 11 children, and he crossed the Yabuk. So imagine how strange. He just divided everyone into these two camps, made this whole big deal out of it. Then he gathers everyone together, wakes up in the middle of the night, and starts crossing the river. Now, wasn't the whole point of the dividing to protect them? What is it urgent for Yaakov to get up in the middle of the night and start crossing everywhere? Imagine him picking up each child in the pitch black darkness and crossing them the river. Like, okay, tomorrow you can cross the river. We're going towards, you know, this meeting with Asaph. What is the rush in the middle of the night? And who even crosses rivers in the middle of the night? I mean, it's so dangerous. And then he starts moving all of his stuff. It says that he starts moving all of his property across. And then, you know, it's like, you have to think about how, how illogical this is. You know, in the nighttime, you should be happy that there's this natural barrier, a river between you and Asaph. The nighttime is the most vulnerable time of night, of, of day, right? So if Asaph came, at least there would be a river slowing him down. What is the rush to cross the river towards Asaph? And then Yaakov gets everyone across and it says that he's left alone. Why is he left alone? Clearly his whole family is on one side of the river. Imagine how they're like waiting for him. And then he's on the other side of the river. He's alone. Why is he alone? Rashi famously says that he went back to get his small dishes, which is of course very strange. Like you're trying, you're leaving your whole family alone. The family you were so worried about. What if Asaph shows up? Like you're going back because you forgot a few little dishes. The, you know, it seems like he's leaving his family open to attack for these few little pots and pans. The Midrash says, well, the righteous are very careful with their property and they don't waste money. But I mean, really, does that make sense? He just gave herds and herds of livestock as gifts to Asaph in order to protect his family. Why would he put them at risk for a few little cups and dishes that he could just buy new ones tomorrow? And then the story gets even crazier. An angel suddenly starts wrestling with him and hurts him in the sciatic nerve, the Gita Nashe. And from then on, it says, we don't eat the sciatic nerve. Why is Hashem bothering him? He seems to be doing, Yaakov seems to be doing exactly what Hashem has asked from him. Hashem told him, go meet with Asaph. I'm going to protect you. He's putting all of his affairs in orders, preparing for all types of, you know, eventualities that could happen in this meeting, seeming to be a good father, protecting his family. Why are you going after him? And then even deeper a question is, why is this injury memorialized? Like, what is so great? Is there something to be proud of? Why are we always not eating the sciatic nerve and all the animals that will ever eat, like Israel never eats the sciatic nerve? Why? You know, in China, we're known as the people who don't eat the sciatic nerve. Like that, it became part of our identity. So, you know, what the heck is going on here? And then suddenly the angel thinks it's not important to keep fighting with him after the sun comes up. Like, why does the sun coming up matter? Everything was driving me crazy. And finally, I learned this year the explanation of the Rosh Bam, Rabbi Shmuel ben Meir, the grandson of Rashi, whose commentary on the Torah we've discussed many times. And he says something that after you read it, you're like, oh, and then you don't even understand how it wasn't obvious to you to begin with. Like, it seems like, oh, of course. The way we always understand this is that in the middle of the night, he gets up and he's crossing over towards his meeting with Asaph. The Rosh Bam says, no, he was running away. He planned to meet Asaph. He had this whole double plan of if we fight and if we make peace, but he got cold feet. He woke up in the middle of the night and he was too scared. He tried to run away. He wasn't giving up a natural barrier. He was trying to create one. He was trying to cross over the river and run in the opposite direction. And the Rosh Bam doesn't only claim this. He, he, he brings a pretty 
impressive proof. In 2 Samuel chapter 17, there's one other time that the place Machanaim is mentioned, and it's in the context of David running away with Absalom. And there are many linguistic parallels in that story. And David also crosses the river right there. And it says that he's in Machanaim. It's like this is Bible code for stories of running away. When the book of Samuel is using this language repetitively, it's to remind you of another story that he already assumes that you understand as a story of warning when and saying like, oh yeah, David is running away in the same way that Yaakov was running away. And then when you read this, you're like, oh my gosh, now this is all making sense. All of a sudden, all of our questions get answered. He crossed the river because not to meet, you know, when he was planning to meet Asaph, he did all this stuff, you know, to, to protect his camp, to divide his camp. He's trying to sleep. If you guys are insomniacs, any of you guys are insomniacs like me, I hope you aren't, but you'll know that like when you're in bed, you start getting your anxieties and thinking about all the things that can go wrong. He wakes up. It's saying two times that he sleeps and wakes up, right? To show us that he's like not able to sleep. He's not able to calm down. And so what is he doing? He wakes up and he says, I can't do this. I cannot face my brother. I cannot face the past. And he starts to run away. And now it makes sense. Why does he go back and get these utensils? Who in their right mind would leave their family alone just to get some pots and pans? Unless they were covering up their trail so that Asab couldn't track him. And it also explains to us why Hashem sent an angel. Angel, Hashem is not sending an angel to bully him and bother him, but to bother him. Hashem is sending an angel to stop him because he had been commanded to go meet up with Asab and he was trying to run away. He lost his courage. So the angel is wrestling with him to stop him. How does somebody hit the sciatic nerve, which is in the back of your leg, it's when you're in the direction of running away. He's trying to run away. He's trying to use the darkness to run away, which is why when the sunlight comes out, he can say like, okay, we're done because you can't run away in the sunlight. Asaph is approaching. He's going to see you. And there's such a deep message here. It's like, you know, even the four, our forefathers sometimes will want to run away. You will want to sometimes run away from the things that you know you need to face, that you know Hashem wants you to face. And Hashem will send you all kinds of angels because our job in this world is to go through corrections. You're born with certain characteristics and your job in this life will be to fix them. Yaakov was named Yaakov because he didn't face things directly. He would always go round about. His name means heal. He always would run away. He doesn't face his father and say, you should bless me. I deserve it. He doesn't face Asaph and say, this is why I did what he did. He doesn't face Lavan each time he runs away. He goes round about. And what is the Torah saying to you? You're going to run away, but you're not going to be able to run away. You're going to want to, but you will end up limping if you do that because there are angels that will stop you. And you know, it's so interesting when you look at the sciatic nerve, it's a nerve that goes down exactly to the heel. He's damaged right in that place. That's his name. Yaakov, he's damaged all the way down because like you will either fix those things, that, those shortcomings that you're born with, or you will walk away limping. And what's so great is when Jacob meets Asab, you know, it's so interesting. He says, when I see your face, it's like seeing the face of Elohim. And we know in many places that one of Hashem's name is Elohim, of course, but also that the Torah sometimes uses the word Elohim to mean angels. Sometimes he uses it to mean like a judge or an important person. I don't know what is the exact meaning here, but Sforno and Onkelos and others say that it's like seeing a prince, a minister, a judge, an important person. That's the meaning here. So he's saying, when I see your face, it's like I'm seeing a judge. Maybe that's the meaning. Because when you see when he sees Asaph, he's reminded of those places where he, of those times in his life where he did not live up to his own standard that he knew he needed to live up with. And what is less, what is more scary and less pleasant than facing that mirror? That is the true judge, right? Like the most judge thing is to actually see the places where you fell short of your own values that you set forth for yourself. It's so painful and you're going to want to run away from that. And now you can understand why this is commemorated forever by the Jewish people. The name Yaakov becomes Israel. Yaakov means heal. I am damaging your heel. You can't use it anymore. You can't run away anymore. But that's what you've been doing. But now you're going to change. You're going to be Israel. Israel means to struggle. You struggle face first. You struggle directly. And Israel, even the name, is in future tense. Meaning, yes, you've struggled with me, the angel, but you're going to keep on struggling. You're going to face your mission and your and your challenges in life forward on. We're going to and we commemorate that forever because that's what we need to do as individuals and as a nation. Isn't it interesting? There are only two commandments that are eternally related to our forefathers. And both of them relate to injuries. One of them is Avraham being circumcised. And one of them is to not eat this Yidan Hashem, the sciatic nerve, because of Yaakov. It's like two sides of the same coin. Hashem tells Avraham, you know, this is going to be your mission and you need to do this circumcision. And Avraham says like, yes, and he faces it no matter how painful it is. He faces it voluntarily. He faces it 
like face first. And then Yaakov also gets a mission and he wants to run away. And Hashem says, no, you're not going to be able to run away. And he's damaged through that. It's like to say, you are going, you know, when we do a circumcision, we say, your true life will come from this blood. Meaning, what does that mean? Your real purpose in life is going to come from the pain and the struggles. You're going to face pain and struggles. Our forefathers face pain and struggles. And you're going to have the urge like Yaakov to just wake up in the middle of the night and say, I can't do this. I'm going to run away. And so forever we commemorate these two options as if to say, like, we know that there will be struggles and there will be pain. Are you going to face them covenantally? Are you going to face them with courage? Or are you going to try to run away? Because you are going to face them no matter what. You will face, you will see the face of Elohim. You will see that reflection, that judge of where you've fallen short. Are you going to face that courageously or not? And I think that that might be one of the hidden messages of this very mysterious Torah portion. With that, I wish everybody a beautiful, blessed, and courageous week. Bye, guys.